DNA technology has improved immensely over the years, especially within the last few. More and more cold cases are being pried open and investigated again after years or even decades of collecting dust, so that new DNA databases and methods can be put to work and finally provide answers to grieving victim families across the world. These cold cases had no hope of ever being solved, yet thanks to state-of-the-art tools they finally were. Number 5 Karen O'Grady was formerly married to an American musician and singer Bill Medley. Because of this, she lived her life in a bit of a spotlight which made her passing even more notorious. On January 30, 1976, 32-year-old Karen dropped off her youngest son Bill before making a quick trip home. She only planned to be there for a minute or so, but hours passed and her friends had still not heard from her. Karen was suffering from an injured leg after trying to ride her son's skateboard. She was using a pair of crutches and getting around quite slowly. Her friends assumed that something may have happened related to her leg like a dangerous fall. Still concerned, the friends stopped by her home to check in on her. Their knocks went unanswered, so they finally opened the door and unlocked the door, and noticed her crutches had been thrown on the floor near the entrance. They called out for her and continued walking further into the hole. Suddenly, a man came from the hallway, greeted them casually, and left before any questions could be asked. The pair then went into Karen's bedroom where they found that she'd been attacked and assaulted. The friends called 911 and Karen was rushed to the hospital. Sadly, four days later, she passed away. Investigators ruled out Karen's ex-husband and both of her friends, causing their focus to shift toward the mysterious man that was spotted in the house. Unfortunately, the description of the man that was provided showed that he was rather average looking. No leads were ever identified and the case went cold, staying that way for over 41 years until it was finally solved in 2017. The case had been opened in the 1990s and while detectives were able to obtain new DNA samples from the evidence, they failed to find a match. In 2017 though, the case was visited once again for its possible connection to a scandal at a preschool where Karen's son had attended. No connection was found but detectives used this opportunity to revisit some old DNA samples using new methods. The path they chose was familial DNA, a process that allows DNA samples to be tested against living relatives of suspects. This method is useful in case the suspect is deceased or unwilling to provide a sample. It's a controversial method to some, but it's been responsible for solving numerous cases over the years. A match was found and Karen's attacker was finally identified. Kenneth Troyer was a criminal with a hefty resume including a series of robberies and assaults in Karen's area around the same time that she lost her life. Unfortunately, Kenneth escaped the long arm of the law in this case because he'd passed away in 1982 after a standoff with police. Although he didn't have to face a court trial, Karen's family was pleased to know that the identity of her killer was finally revealed, all thanks to new DNA methods. Number 4 Lori Ann Smith was a 28-year-old marketing professional and a youth counselor at Union Christian Church of College Park. She was described as being friendly, kind, and happy. In May of 1997, her bright light was taken from this world when she was gunned down in her bathroom. Her parents had just returned from a day out and found their daughter on the bathroom floor in the midst of a nightmarish scene. In the following investigation, a significant amount of blood not belonging to Lori was found. Obviously, it was assumed that this belonged to her attacker and that Lori fought for her life before it was taken. The blood was tested using the best technology at the time, but that wasn't enough to find a decent match. The case came to a halt and resources had to be distributed elsewhere, so the case ran cold. In 2018, cold case specialists revisited the case, knowing that new tech could be of use solving it. The secondary blood samples were submitted to a DNA genealogy company with a vast database known as Parabon. If this name sounds familiar, it's because Parbon has been responsible for solving numerous cases as of late and works closely with Ancestry.com. Parbon found a DNA match from an individual trying to research their family tree. This just so happened to be a relative of a killer. More testing was done and eventually detectives were able to confirm that Jerry Lee was responsible. Jerry was tracked down and arrested in Alabama, only to be extradited to Georgia where he faced trial. He was charged with six counts, murder, felony murder, armed robbery, aggravated assault with a weapon, burglary, and possession of a firearm. Despite Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard's advice to not offer a bond, a judge allowed Jerry to pay $150,000 bond to be released during his trial. In May of 2019, he was released 
and is being allowed to process through trial without being held behind bars. While the alleged killer has not been identified, Lori's family is still stricken with grief and concern over whether or not the justice system will prevail in this case. Jerry was lucky enough to avoid capture for over 20 years, and they're hoping that it won't remain this way. Still, his arrest should be viewed as a positive thing regardless, because at least someone was identified. Number 3 21-year-old Julia Woodard left her home in San Rafael on February 1, 1979 with the intention of job hunting in Reno and Lake Tahoe. However, her plans would be interrupted later that day when she vanished. She was dropped off at an airport by a friend who was never seen again. A hectic search ensued and for two months there was no sign of the young woman until her remains were tragically found in the wooded area of Hungry Valley's Eagle Canyon. An autopsy report showed that she'd been struck in the back of the head. Oddly enough, another victim, Jeannie Smith, was last seen October 28, 1978. It was later found in a similar area, not far from Julia. She'd also been struck in the head and police connected the two crimes together thanks to their uncanny resemblance. Despite DNA being collected from both sites, police were unable to identify a match or a suspect. Both cases ran out of momentum and went cold shortly after. For four whole decades, the cases just sat on a shelf and waited for their next turn. Finally, in 2019, cold case specialists revisited the case, as they had been doing with many others, to use new DNA testing methods to try and track down a match. Around the time the case was reopened, Friends and relatives of a 73-year-old man named Charles Gary Sullivan came forward to voice their concerns that Charles was responsible for the crimes. Charles had a criminal record and countless run-ins with police. It was later discovered that Charles had served time in a California prison where mandatory biological DNA samples were collected and archived from each inmate. Washoe Sheriff's Detective Rick Belke took samples from Julia's case and compared it to the samples from Charles. A match was immediately found and Charles was hunted down. He was found living in Arizona and was extradited to Reno just a few days later. He's currently awaiting the trial process and detectives have reason to believe that he may have been involved in countless other murders in Arizona, Las Vegas, and California. Therefore, they're taking advantage of new DNA technology and encouraging units responsible for similar cold cases in the region to reopen them and compare samples. So, not only is Charles being brought to justice for his crimes against Jeannie and Julia, but the victims of many other cases may finally be solved thanks to new tech and hardworking law enforcement officials. Number 2 In July of 1981, 20-year-old Selena Ko was reported missing by her family after failing to return home or keep in contact. A search followed and officers quickly made a gruesome discovery on July 16th when they found the young mother thrown beneath bushes along a deserted street. She'd been attacked, assaulted, and dumped like garbage. DNA samples were collected from the scene, some of which were believed to belong to the killer. DNA technology wasn't advanced enough for the samples to be of use and the case ran cold in a matter of months. Five years later, in June of 1986, another woman was reported missing under the same circumstances. 22-year-old Mary Dugan was found shoved in the trunk of her own car which had been left in an empty parking lot on June 9th. Tissues had been shoved down her throat and she suffered the same signs of attack as the previous mentioned victim. Furthermore, the DNA collected from this scene was a match for the samples in Selena's case. While the cases could be officially linked together, a suspect still wasn't found. Mary's case joined Selena's in running cold and both were reopened in 2019 by cold case detectives. According to reports, this was the first LAPD case to use new genealogy DNA testing methods. The method certainly lived up to its reputation because within just a few short weeks, a suspect was identified. Horace Van Vaults Jr. was arrested for the crimes and is being charged with two counts of murder, among many other smaller charges. Officers are also looking into his possible involvement in other cases across California. It's easy to assume that this method of DNA testing will certainly be used again in LAPD cases, as well as cases across the country. In fact, every day more and more cold cases are being reopened thanks to these new methods. Number 1 On April 26, 1993, the body of a young woman was found on campus by the custodial staff at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. The body was found in a bathtub and was later confirmed to be Sophie Sergi, a 21-year-old woman from a Yukon River village. 
Sophie was on campus visiting a friend when she was randomly and brutally attacked to the point that her life was taken. The case stirred quite a buzz as a warning that the campus was no longer safe and the otherwise warm community wasn't as innocent as many believed. A vigil was held for Sophie and a detailed investigation was performed. DNA not belonging to Sophie, likely that of the killer, was collected and submitted to a DNA database. Similarly, it was compared to thousands of samples that the district archived in the months following Sophie's passing. Still, months passed with no sign of justice in the distance. The case went cold and Sophie's killer was left to live a free life, possibly harming others along the way. In 2018 though, the case was reopened as part of a cold case crackdown, which organized and retested evidence in numerous cases. The DNA from Sophie's crime scene was submitted to a genealogy database that used new technology and a match was finally found after 26 years. 44-year-old Stephen H. Downs from Auburn, Maine was a perfect match to the DNA. Additionally, it was discovered that he was a student at UAF at the time of the murder. He was apprehended and later extradited to face trial in Alaska, the home of the crime. There have been no updates on his case, but we hope justice will finally be served and peace could be had. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this narration, maybe consider checking out my personal channel at youtube.com slash Ty underscore knots. And if you like this video, be sure to click that like button, subscribe, and click the notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads.